tell you a quick story. Uh, my wife and I moved into a single family community when, uh, a number of years ago. We had lived in a high rise condo for many years. And uh, it's a gated community, but we didn't think about that. So we got all excited the first Halloween there. So we went out and I bought about, well, I almost closed the public store. I bought so much candy. And, and so we get in, then she said, well, we got to get into costumes. So she laid me up as Dracula and all So it was around 6 o'clock and we sat in that waiting for the to show up. So, well, we want to have a little wine. So we'll make a long story short. We're still sitting there around 8, 8, 30, and that one kid showed up. And, oh, wow. So it's okay, it's okay. Then we realized, well, wait a minute. This is a gated community. You know, high-end houses and everything. What's the likelihood of there going to be kids walking around here. So the next year, we said, we'll do the opposite. Let's take our wine glasses and let's go knocking on our neighbor's doors and say, trick or treat. <laughs> so we started a whole new thing in our community. We walk around with wine glasses now. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, good morning. And uh, I just want you to know that I'm pleased to be here and I'm honored to be here. Real quick, I've been in the real estate business for over 40 years. Uh, I've done just about everything you can do in real estate. My career has been a combination of hard work uh, and luck. And you got to have some combination of those to get anywhere. So, but I have done a lot of different things. And, uh, and for the last 20 years, I've been a, a consultant to the industry. Uh, my clients over the years have been major Wall Street firms, Goldman Sachs, the like, banks, major developers, home builders. Uh, and I do a lot of strategic planning uh, for companies. I do a lot of uh, marketing, branding, all kinds of things like that. Before that, I was a major developer for many years. Uh, yes, I built a lot of houses, but I also developed a lot of land. I, I built communities all over North America, large master plan communities. Uh, if you know anything about the Boca area, there's a big, big project there called Boca Point. Uh, I was president of the company that built that, one of the biggest communities in South Florida. So anyway, I'm here to share with you a little bit of my knowledge. I, I, I must preface what I'm going to say that I do not have all the answers. And I'm, I'll try to answer your question at the end of this. I just want you to know that I'm also here to learn. Because I look forward to learning something new every day of my life. Uh, today, I, I want to try, in the time I, uh, uh, allotted me, I want to try to speak very generally about the real estate industry. I mean, I've been involved with this program for six, seven years, um, as, uh, as, you, as you heard. I'm chairman of the advisory board for this program. We have 18 advisors on our advisory board. Uh, these are some people like myself from all over the industry, alumni, ex-students who got their degrees and so forth. And so I, 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 it's kind of like a part of me, this program. So, um, and so I know I've been asked many times, I'm making the sacrifice. I'm spending a lot of money borrowing a lot of money in most cases to get this MSRED degree. What the hell for? What, what, what do you do with this thing? And, and I want to be different than everybody else. I want to have something that takes me a notch above the other guy so I can get ahead and so forth. And, and my, my hat's off to you. It's a major sacrifice that you're, you're undertaking. Hopefully, it, it'll work out for you in the long run. Just remember one thing. If you get through this program, and they put those letters MS, RBD after your name, no one can ever take those letters away from you again. You own them for the rest of your life. And other people don't. So uh, I think that's very important. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, those kind of things, but I also want to spend a little time giving you a little background of history on where we came from in real estate development 
and where we are today. How does that relate today? And I'm a big believer in you can't go forward totally blind to what went on before you. You really have to have an idea of what the foundation is of where we are and, 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 and where we're going. Uh, I mean, a map is a very important thing. It tells you two things. It tells you where you are today and hopefully it tells you where you're going to be when you get there. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, is this the first one up? Yeah. How do I uh, move this up and down? I'm not very good at this. Um, how, how do I make... See, I told you I'm here to learn something. <laughs> sent this out. I don't know if you got a chance to see this or not. Um, Dr. Froge asked me, well, what kind of things would you like to talk about? And I said, I don't know. I'd like to know what they want me to talk about. So I had suggested these six broad subjects. Each one of them, in my opinion, are very, very related to real estate and real estate development, believe it or not. One is autonomous cars, which is going to be driverless cars and driverless trucks. And I can spend two hours with you very easily on how that's going to affect your real estate in the future. What is health and wellness development and how important it is? I think health and wellness development and everything connected with health and wellness is one of the biggest real estate opportunities for you people in the future. Uh, global warming the myths and realities of that, whether you like it or not, whether you believe in it or not, whether, whatever, it's going to affect real estate development. It's going to affect real estate that's in place today, and it's going to seriously affect all of the new real estate development in the future. History of real estate industry since World War II, I'm, I'm going to tell, I'm going to do that one. For the, so that one's a very important part of this one. Career opportunities, I'm going to do that too. And what, what am I going to try to do? I'm not going to try to tell you how and where you're going to get a job. But I know from experience that students in this program have a very limited understanding of the real estate industry, of, of how it's structured and what are its components and where are there opportunities for you in the future. And I always get uh, wow, <laughs> I didn't know that, you know, and who knew? So we're going to do a little bit of that, and then hopefully we'll have some end time at the end that you guys can just ask me any question you want, including what I'm going to do for Halloween tonight. So, <laughs> um, so that being said, um, we'll try to cover the, I got some responses back, and, and it was all over the ballpark what some of the students wanted, so... I just wanted to tell you that, to give you some flavor of the diversity of the things we're going to try to talk about here this morning. Uh, so, without, can I jump to that program now? Um, which one? The uh, the one that was buried in that email. Okay, let me pull that up. Yeah. Now, I want you to watch a short presentation that was made at the Earth and Land Institute meeting in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. It's by a futurist, one of these guys who dream about tomorrow and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and because I want to set a tone here today. I think you're all young people. You probably are aware of 90% of what he says. For old people like me, it's like a wow all the time I, when I hear about what he talks about. But I'm, I'm, I want to do this and say, this is where we have to put our minds. When we talk about today, <coughs> we talk about your future. Because you have to be standing in the right mental, on the right mental platform. And we're going to try to help you do that. Uh, so let's see if you can. It is. Yeah, is that it? No, that's not it. Oh, that's not it? No. no, I don't want to try. Come down, go back again. Yeah. 
it's stands for, it's an acronym, it's how I want you to think about the future and how to future-proof your business. What it stands for is awareness, humility, and action. I'm going to walk you through these three principles. But the first thing, and I just want to echo Charles thoughts, I'm really optimistic about the future. And let me just give you uh, one big reason why. I'm actually going to do it on both hands, so I want you to think about uh, this. Can anyone tell me what the mathematical relationship between these numbers is? One thousand million billion trillion? Each one is a thousand times larger than the next. The reason I tell you this is there are an extraordinary number of technologies that are doubling. And many of them are going to double ten times in the coming decade. But if something doubles ten times, it's not ten times as large. It is a thousand times as large. We go to 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1,024. What that means is, if we're in a technology today and it's in the thousands, but it's doubling, we're going to be in the millions in a decade's time. If we're in the millions today, but it's doubling, we're going to be in the billions. Each one is a quantitative leap ahead. And now, let me walk you through at least 10 trends that are going to transform the world and make it a decidedly better place. And these are in no particular order, but the first trend I want to tell you about is wearable technology. Really, it's only a couple of years old. Apple Watch just came out six months ago. It's going to transform the retail experience. It's going to transform banking. Many of you are already wearing uh, Fitbit, a fuel band, or Jawbone. Could I just see how many of you already wear a, a device like that? So it looks like about 10%. But has it ever occurred to you, well, what might the Fitbit 2.0 of the near future look like? We know it's coming. We just don't know exactly when. Well, here's one idea. So I don't know if that is creepy, cool, or a coming sign of the apocalypse. <laughs> but here's the transition you're living through, we're living through, and I don't think most people appreciate it. You and I grew up in a world where we first went to the internet through our desktop computer. Now we're going to the internet through our smartphone. In the not too distant future, the internet and its information is going to come directly to us. And this is going to transform the world in some profound ways. How many of you know what this technology is? Can I see a show of hands? Handful of you do, it's called the Oculus Rift. Here's a, a, a short thing that you need to know about it. It's 24 months ago, the idea for this technology and the virtual reality goggles was just an idea in a teenager's head. A couple of months ago, Facebook bought that company for $2 billion. And why did they buy virtual reality goggles? It's not just because they saw an opportunity to transform gaming and education. They see an implication that's going to affect your industry. Here's what Facebook really might want to do with Oculus Rift. This is a mall of the future. is this technology is just going to get better, faster, and more affordable. And maybe one of the really big demographics who will be utilizing this technology are seniors who are no longer as mobile. But might that have some implication on the number of malls that we have in the future? Yeah, it's a possibility. Here's another trend I want to tell you about. How many of you are familiar with 3D printing, additive manufacturing? This is the physical printing out of objects. 
It might interest you to know that General Electric has already printed all of the operational components for a jet aircraft engine. All of these parts are 3D printed. And they have said by 2017, so just two years, they're going to be printing aircraft engine parts. Now, what is the implication to your industry? Well, think about this. What does it mean for the global supply chain when in the near future, instead of printing or producing and manufacturing very sophisticated objects over in Asia and over in Europe, putting them on ships, transporting them across oceans, bringing them into ports, putting them on trucks, delivering them to warehouses, in the not too distant future, we're gonna be printing very sophisticated objects right in your backyard. What are the implications of that. It's a trend that you need to be aware of. And to just show you how fast this trend is moving, here's what they're doing over in China. Printing homes. This is where we are today. If that trend undergoes a thousand fold increase, where might we be in the near future? And if you don't think this trend is coming, fast. Just a couple of weeks ago over in Italy, this is the world's largest 3D printer. Two stories tall. Their hope is to build affordable housing for poor people all across the developing world. Will this come to fruition? I don't know for certain, but the potential with exponential growth uh, suggests that it is a real possibility. The third trend I want to introduce you to is advances in nanotechnology. If any of you have the new Samsung phone, it has a new self-healing nanomaterial in it. And here's what your phone can already do today. In their video, they scratch the phone up and down on the back next to a regular vacuum. Then after two minutes of sitting, the G-Flex actually completely heals, almost, while the regular phone is, of course, still scratched. Now, the Self-healing materials are a reality. A couple of years ago, uh, nano-enhanced products were a $100 million a year global industry. Today, in 2015, it's about a $10 billion a year global industry. By 2020, it's expected to be a $100 billion a year global industry. From 100 million to 100 billion, that's a thousand-fold increase. But what else are we doing, and how might this trend affect your industry? Well, we're now working on self-healing concrete. We're just at the early stages, but if this trend undergoes a thousand-fold increase, what does that mean for your industry? Uh, and here's another material that's just being developed not too far from here at Stanford University. It's a new nano material. It's called passive radiative cooling, and the material actually, with no air conditioning, lowers the temperature inside a building by five degrees Celsius. So is that a material that some of you might need to be aware of? Might it? reduce your energy consumption in the near future? Might it impact or lessen the amount of carbon we're emitting into the atmosphere? Absolutely, just another reason why I'm optimistic about the future. Trend number four, another thousand fold increase, only this time we're starting from a base of tens of thousands, but we're gonna go to millions. This is uh, the robotics revolution. Of course, drones are already here, but let me just show you this little clip. What I like about that clip is just to show you how safe drones are getting. Could I see a show of hands? How many of you are already using drones on your construction sites? Could I just see a, a show of hands? So it looks like 5%. But might that number increase to 10, 20, 40, 80% in the near future? Absolutely. If you're not thinking about how to employ drone technology in your facilities today, you might already be behind the curve. Uh, but how many of you know this? Self-driven robotic cars are already legal here in the state of California. How many? knew that. Well, that's a fact. But let me show you what they're doing over in Gothenburg, Sweden with self-driven uh, autonomous cars. Of course, we have objected in 2017 to actually bring 100 self-driving cars to our customers on real roads here in Gothenburg. 100 self-driven cars in a couple of years, and 200 a year after that, 400, then suddenly a thousand-fold increase. And if you don't think this trend is coming fast, how many of you saw just last week that Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, announced that his Teslas are gonna have an autonomous driving capability within the next three years? But if you think about how Uber has transformed transportation in urban areas like San Francisco, what is the future of urban areas in a world of self-driven autonomous vehicles going to look like? 
Well, these are the types of things that you need to be aware of and you need to be thinking about sooner rather than later. The sixth trend you need to be aware of, another thousand fold increase. Only this time we're going from millions to billions and this is the number of computer chips, sensor technology we're putting on physical objects. We're going to go from hundreds of millions today to 50, an estimated 50 billion by 2020. To help you understand why this is so important, a couple of companies have done some reports on the economic opportunity here, and they're saying within the next decade, a, a super smart world is an economic opportunity of anywhere from seven to 19 trillion dollar business uh, uh, opportunity. Let me just show you a couple of these opportunities. Uh, the first, uh, or the greatest one is smart buildings. This is Steider Electric's headquarters over in uh, Paris, France. A couple of years ago, they retrofitted it with 10,000 sensors to make it a super smart building. Their goal was to reduce energy consumption in that building by 80% by the year 2020. Well, they implemented the project in 2012. By 2014, just last year, they had already reduced their energy consumption by 85%. The number of smart buildings that are expected to come online by 2020 estimated to grow 40-fold. So if you're not already thinking about how you make your buildings and facilities super smart in order to reduce energy consumption, you're already behind the curve. But this technology is just going to get better, faster, and more affordable. The seventh trend I want to tell you about, you might not think uh, too much about this, but uh, gene sequencing technology is getting better every four months. Here's what this means, is uh, eight years ago, this fellow, his name is Craig Venter, said, hey, I want to sequence my genome, and that's exactly what he did. But eight years ago, it cost him $150 million to sequence his genome. Not very practical. But technology is getting better every four months, which means the corollary is the price is cut in half every four months. And if you cut $150 million in half starting in 2007, something remarkable happens. And here's what's going to happen. By the year 2020, it's going to be more expensive for you to flush your toilet than it is to sequence your genome. That's extraordinary. What cost $150 million eight years ago is going to be pennies in the future? Yes. And this is going to have profound implications on human health and on the pharmaceutical industry. Well, what's the implication to you? Well, I think one of the things we as a society have to do is start preparing for us living to 100, 110, and possibly 120. I suspect some of you are thinking to yourself, ooh, I don't want to live to 120. I'm going to suggest that living to 120 in the future is not going to be anything like living to 120 today. Our brains are going to be sharper, our knees are going to be stronger, our hips are going to be more flexible. The world is going to be a decidedly different place. But how are we going to house all of these individuals? And maybe they're going to have to begin working for a little bit longer. And what are the implications to your industry in this world that might be here before many of us are really ready for it? The eighth trend you need to be aware of, artificial intelligence, uh, computer processing power. Here's how I want you to think about this. A couple of years ago, you might remember uh, IBM put its supercomputer Watson on the game show Jeopardy. That computer was capable of 70 trillion calculations per second. To help you understand 70 trillion calculations per second, imagine you had a handheld calculator and you had to do 70 trillion calculations. Do you know how long it would take you to do that? Assuming you could work 365, 24-7, it would only take you 60 million years to do what that machine does in one second. The reason I tell you this is one of the reasons why people miss the future is they fail to appreciate even our tools are getting exponentially more powerful. How can we sequence the genome ever faster? Well, our tools are getting faster. How can we discover the next net generation nanomaterial that's going to revolutionize the construction world? Well, we can simulate it on these tools. But of course, that's not the only thing we're using artificial intelligence for. Four years ago, it was on a game show. Today, many people in the real estate industry have already hired Watson, and what they're doing is they're using all Watson's cognitive power to help figure out where to locate buildings in the most efficient way. They understand demographics, they understand transportation, they understand labor and land costs, and they are helping your competitors make better decisions. So if you're not already thinking about how to employ this tool, again, you need to be aware of it, and you might already be behind the curve. The ninth trend I want to tell you about, another thousand-fold increase, is data storage. The amount of data we are collecting is growing exponentially. But here's how I want you to think about this and its implications to you. 
Uh, here in San Francisco, Seattle, a handful of other areas, Amazon is now getting into the grocery delivery business. Do they really want to be in the grocery delivery business? I don't think so. They're in the data business. Every time you buy something, what you buy, when you buy it, how you want it delivered, when you want it delivered, they're learning a little bit more about you. And two years ago, they were on 60 Minutes and uh, their program to uh, make deliveries with drone got a lot of press, but they said something far more interesting in that interview, and it didn't get a lot of coverage, but it's going to affect many of you in this room. Here's what they said, here's their end goal, here's what Amazon really wants to do. Anything you want on, on Earth, you're going to get for us. Anything you want on Earth, you're going to get for us. That's where we're headed. Anything on Earth, not just books, not just consumer items, anything on Earth. And they are now collecting so much data on their customers that their end goal is to know what you want to buy before you even know what you want to buy. And if you don't believe this, just a couple of months ago, they filed a patent for predictive shipping. They're going to start strategically placing objects in San Francisco, other cities, in the anticipation that you're going to buy them, and they're going to deliver it to you as quickly as possible. This is going to profoundly affect the retail, the transportation, and the delivery markets, and you need to understand the second and third order implications of your business because this world is coming down upon all of us really fast. So all of this change, this gets to the H and the big aha, you need humility. Humility to the idea that what served us well yesterday might not be sufficient moving forward. And here's what I mean by humility. What I want you to do now is I want you to turn to the person next to you and answer for them this simple question. What two colors are the yield sign here in North America? Go ahead. Tell Good, do that. Do that when you use it. What's the color of the yield sign? On the All right, I already uh, heard the answer. Uh, those of you who said uh, yellow and black, uh, congratulations. That was the right answer up until 1971. <laughs> Red and white for over 40 years. Since Richard Nixon was in the White House. <laughs> so some of you are going, no way, that's not true. Uh, but so what does this mean? Well, those of you who said yellow and black, let me just give you an idea of what your brain kind of looks like. Here's what your brain kind of looks like. <laughs> the message that I want to deliver here is that, look, we all, there are certain things that we learned early on about our industry that, like the yield sign, absolutely, they were correct years ago. But the world has changed, but our thinking has not. We all have to have humility to the idea that not everything that sits up here is still necessarily true. And so let me give you another example. If I were to ask you five years ago, what color is a taxi, what would many of you have said? You would have said, well, they're yellow. Well, of course, they're not yellow anymore, are there? How many of you have already used Uber or know what Uber is? Let me see a show of hands. Yeah, well over half the room. This company has a valuation of $50 billion, and it is changing how people think about automobiles. No longer do they need to own an automobile, they just need to access an automobile. And they are moving to cities like San Francisco and Seattle that have a strong network of drivers. So they never have to own an automobile in the first place. But of course, that's not the only thing that's going to be Uberized, is it? We're already figuring out how to Uberize office workspace. WeWork has a valuation of $10 billion trying to figure out how we use these new tools that we have today to make the best, most efficient use of all of our physical real estate holdings. But of course, it's not just enough to be aware of these change and to uh, have humility. We have to take action. And let me give you one big action I think all of you need to take as leaders is on a regular basis, take an entire week just to think about the future. I can already hear what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, who the hell do you think you are to tell me I have to take a week just to think? Don't you understand how busy I am? I do. But if a week is too much, break it down. Take an hour a week. Take 12 minutes a day. Just read and reflect on how your world is changing. Let me give you some trends that I think you should be thinking about. Here's one. This is North America's first truly net zero energy building. It just went live last year in Evanston, Illinois. Does the possibility exist for you to have a truly net zero energy building in the near future? I think it does. You need to be thinking about that. Uh, North America's first urban farm just went live in Newark, New Jersey, of all places. This might be a trend that grows exponentially. Maybe that's something that you need to be thinking about. 
online education, what, how that's going to transform the universities of the future, something you need to be thinking about. Are we still going to be going to campuses with buildings? I suspect some of us still will, but not everyone. These trends are going to have direct implications to you, and you need to be thinking about them sooner rather than later. But let me just wrap up and say, here's how I want you to think about the future. I want all of you to picture a pond the size of this room. And let's say it's the first day of September. And on this pond, there's a perfectly sized lily pad on the first day of the month. It then doubles. So on the second there are two. The next day we go to four. Then we go to eight, 16, 32, 64. But then on the last day of September, the entire lily pad, or the entire pond is covered with lily pads. I now want you to think an answer to this question. On day 20, so two thirds of the way through that percentage, or through that exercise, what percentage of the pond is already covered with lily pads? I want you to just think of an answer. Okay, my guess is very few of you said the answer is one-tenth of one percent. You're like, what? What do you mean? You just told me if something doubles ten times, it's going to be a thousand times bigger. Yes, I did. But here's how I want you to think about this. All of these trends I've been telling you about, they have, in fact, been doubling. But we're just at day 20. But if something doubles ten additional times, how much bigger does it get? It's a thousand times bigger. So by day 25, we're just a little over 3%. Not until day 29 that we get over 50, but once we get over 50, boom, the whole thing is covered. I suspect some of you are saying to yourself, well, Mr. Future Man, if the world's changing as fast as you say it is, how come my world feels pretty much the same? My message to you is these trends have, in fact, been doubling. What you have to appreciate is we're just at day 20. The really big change is just ahead of us. That is the world we need to be aware of. This amount of change requires humility, and it demands action. Thank you very much. Okay. I don't know about you, but I found that fascinating. Yes. Um, and, I, and, and I had the yield sign wrong, too. <laughs> and I should, because when I was your age, it was that color. Um, write that, uh, uh, write we work down. We work. You see that on the screen? Yeah. You don't have to do anything with it now, but Google that and look that up later. That's a big, big trend coming in office space and office utilization. You probably heard of it, but it's it's not only coming; it's here. It's taking big, big platforms of office space and breaking it down into 10, 20, 100 pieces. And young people like you come in and rent the desk and rent the connection and everything. And, you're in a room with 20, 30, 40 people like you, and all of a sudden you're talking to the person next to you, and you say, well, what are you doing? And you say, well, I'm working on this. And well, what are you doing? Well, why don't we try to get together and do something like that? And so forth. It's amazing. I've been in one of these down on Brickell. Uh, it was a, an office building that's about half with this concept. They're, they're, they're setting, they're coming up with new business ideas, entrepreneurial ideas, every day, I mean, the number is growing like his numbers are growing. And, and, and it, there's a new form of capitalism, I believe, taking place here. Uh, we're not waiting for the big, big companies that are all floundering in some way today. You, you, your ability to entrepreneur, entrepreneur or jump on somebody else's entrepreneur are becoming easier and easier. Um, the, uh, you notice that the autonomous car? Uh, right now, the city of Miami, Miami-Dade County, and Miami International Airport has a committee working right now, a working committee, where they are going to try, they're trying to get and develop driverless trucks that are going to go to Miami International Airport, which is the largest import city in the world for flowers. I don't know if you know that. Mm -hmm. City of Miami International Airport imports 80% of all the flowers in the United States. And what they're going to do is, they're trying to do is have driverless trucks go to the airport, pick up the flowers, and then take them to all the distribution points through South Florida, the trains, the, the trucking companies, and all those different things without drivers. So if you think, well, this is like something, no, it's here. And, it, and Google has five million miles on six cars already. Three of them went from San Francisco to New York with only two accidents. Totally driverless. 
So uh, they almost can't have accidents when they're all driverless because they are, because if you, if you have it, even stuff in your car today, they avoid each other. And the state of Florida has a working commission right now of 30 very smart people working on autonomous cars and the effect that's going to be and have on the state of Florida in the future. And one of the guys on the committee happens to be a somewhat friend of mine, and he was telling me a couple of months ago that they're predicting that when it's all working, a generation or two from now, cars will only be about two feet apart from each other on the highways. There'll be no fear of an accident or anything. And the other thing is nobody's going to speed. If the speed limit's 75, that's as fast as the car's going to go. So anyway, uh, I'll end on the Mercedes has a car. It's already been on display, it's built. And the inside of the car are four seats. The front two seats swivel around like that chair. There's no steering wheel. And they say this is one of the prototypes of cars coming in the next 10 to 12 years. So what does that all mean to real estate? Well, what it means is we're not going to need as many parking lots. We're not going to need as, as many, like for instance, you want to go to the, you, it's Saturday morning, you want to go to the mall. You say, I don't know, I'm going to go to the mall, I don't know how long I'm going to stay in the mall, but I'm in the mood for just doing some drop dead shopping or something. I'll have lunch, I'll meet my friend there or something. So you get in your car, the car takes you to the mall, and you, so you tell the mall to the car, go back home and wait. <laughs> and four hours later, whenever you feel like it, you call up your car, your car comes from your house, picks you up, and takes you back home. Sound crazy? This is the way a lot of people are thinking right now. <coughs> and you know who's like all of a sudden petrified? <coughs> the cities and, country, and, and counties that have spent hundreds of millions and billions on parking garages and looking forward to the revenues from those garages. Mm -hmm. I mean, I heard a, a, a mayor uh, at, at a, another ULI function said that we are already looking into the future and saying, what kind of an impact it's just going to have on our revenue because we're going to start losing revenue and parking fees in the future with autonomous cars. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, and I don't want to spend any more time on that anymore. But I want to just, like I said, get your mind in a place where you are, you people, are what he's talking about. You're the ones that are going to go from 10 to 20 to 40 to 80. That's your world. And you're either on that train when it leaves the station, or it's going to leave without you. I mean, that's one of my strong messages here today. I didn't have this problem when I was your age. We didn't have any of this stuff. We thought in very small cycles and so forth. Your challenge, and scary as hell, is how do I get on this fast-moving train and, and recognize the opportunities that are going to be there? Because somebody's going to make a lot of money in the right place. So, having said that, I want to move on to, where's my computer guy? Uh, I may be able to get you.
All right. I mentioned before that I wanted to give you a little history of where real estate of today came from. And I'm going to start at a strange time, not a strange time, but I picked the time, because it, it, it was a tipping point of time in America. And it was 1945. And in 1945, we ended World War II. And I think some of you have heard of that. And I'm not being facetious, because I, I, get, I go crazy when I watch, like, when they go out in the street and they ask young people, like, <laughs> You know who fought in World War II? Yeah, I think that was uh, Canada. You know, something like that. <laughs> anyway, prior to World War II, 1939, 1940, the United States, from its inception back to George Washington and everybody, was a nation of renters. About 35% of Americans in 1940 owned their home. The rest of America rented either houses or apartments or something, which was very, very aligned with the way it is in Europe, even today. Europe for centuries, centuries and centuries, was a renting situation with rich landlords owning big real estate. World War II came along. About 13 to 15 million Americans were put into the military and left life for three years, four years, depending on when they were called. And fortunately, we won the war. And fortunately, we came out of the war an industrial economic powerhouse. At that moment in time, one of the most powerful countries ever existed in the history of man that we know. But we had a lot of problems because all of a sudden we had this huge housing shortage um, because we had 13 million military people coming home and saying, where am I going to live? And I've been out of life for two years, three years, four years. I put off getting married, I put off doing this, I put off doing that. And what is this great country going to do for me? So they determined that in 1946-1947, we needed at least 3 million houses almost like immediately. I mean, now we remember, prior to the war, we, we hardly ever built houses. If we built them, we built them to then rent out. Now people said, I want to own my own house. So, now this was all taking place when the population of the United States was only 135 million people. But this was 10% of the country, 10% was in the military in World War II. I mean, just think of that, if that was today. If that was today, there'd be 30 million people in the military. So it was a, it was a significant thing that was going on in our country then. So, So all of a sudden, the government started creating temporary housing. And it was quantity housing. This is just like, like sheets of steel put up. And all of a sudden, people, uh, the military people, and people who aren't in the military, are now living in all of these quantity huts parks that were built all over the United States. And of course, this was not what a country that just won World War II should be doing, and people are saying, what are we going to do? So along comes the government, and they said, we've got to help all these people out. So they created probably the most socialistic program in the history of the United States. They created the GI Bill of Rights. And what the GI Bill of Rights did, gave them free education. Everybody went to school for free. It's like what Bernie Sanders wants to do now. Like, let's have free university education for everybody. Well, they did it back then. And they said, we've got to help people borrow money. We've got to help people buy a house. So they created the Veterans 
finance system where you can get a mortgage on a house with nothing down, maybe $100, and yet back then, low interest rates like today, but, but their mortgage rates back then were like 1%, 1.5%. And we're going to do this all over the place. We're going to allow this money to be spent in the cities and the suburbs and so forth. So what the, what the world was screaming for at that time, and by the way, what the world is screaming for, and I say the world, the United States, is screaming for right now are what I call breakthrough leaders. Human beings that come along just when you think nobody can save the day and have inspiration and vision and so forth. And a guy named Bill Levitt came along, and he built two places called Levittowns. And here's a, an area, an old aerial view of Levittown. He went out into the suburbs of New York City on Long Island, and he went into the suburbs of Pennsylvania, and he took over farms, and he did the first production housing in the history of the world. He turned housing into a factory, an open door factory, and he actually delivered all the pieces to build that house on the site and many people came along to put that house together and this was our first production housing and this and this took us off there. The average house is $8,000, um, no down payment, low mortgage, one, two, three bedrooms, one bath, one car garage, but, but the interesting thing quarter of acre land, which is very rare today. And which by the way gave these houses room for expansion. And if you go to Levittown today, the average house is over 3,000 square feet. Over the years people have taken advantage of the big lots that they had and they've added bedrooms and bathrooms and so forth. So this invigorated a whole bunch of industries construction companies, uh, electricians, carpenters, landlords, created thousands of jobs. And it also started answering the housing problem. So what did this do for the average American? Well, this is a very symbolic picture. Of my, I would say circa about 1950, 1950. And in, you know, I'll use terms of the day. Daddy, mommy, and two kids. That was the profile of the American dream. And folks, that was the start of the American dream. And what it, was, what it do to people that we never had in this country before? It gave people a high degree of self-esteem. I own a house of my own. This was not our history. So we have a whole generation of people now where the mindset goes over to not renting, but to owning. And of course, a high sense of accomplishment. So what did everybody do, people your age? Did everything they could to hurry up and get a good job and get a little money together so they could buy a house. And that's where America, that's where America, okay, so what happened? Well, during the 1950s, there were countless versions of Levittown. Other developers around the country said, hey, I can build a Levittown, but you know what? I'm going to make it a little better. It's not just going to be a street with a lot on it. So they started expanding all over California, Texas, Long Island, New York. I mean, it, communities started growing up everywhere. And now we're really starting to solve our housing problems. But something else happens here. We don't have any roads. I mean, remember, in, in here again, back in 1940, I mean, a very small percentage of people owned cars. There weren't a lot of cars around. So what happened was we turned all of our factories into making airplanes and tanks and guns and everything. And at the end of the war, everybody said, what do we do with all these factories? So General Motors came along, and Chrysler came along, and Ford came along and said, we're going to convert all our factories back to making cars. And we're going to pull those people to work. Well, that was a great idea, but somebody said, well, wait a minute. 
If we stop putting millions of cars on the road, we don't have any roads. Now, you guys just try to imagine life without the interstate system. Just think about that. No I-95, no I-75, no 595, no such roads existed. So, President Eisenhower, who was the president, then says, we need a massive interstate road system that we have to build all over the United States. Because what we learned in World War II is that when we were moving all of our war production and everything, the only thing we could count on was the railroads. Because we didn't have the highways. But guess what? Despite the need for this, the Congress turns them down. Says, no, we're not going to spend $50 billion, $100 billion. Back then, that was a lot of money. So Eisenhower and his staff said, we've got to come up with a reason why we need this in the state highway system. And he came back to Congress and he said, we need this for our national defense. Well, how's that, President? If we go into war again, we got to be able to move all our war materials around this country faster. Because we couldn't do that in World War II. You know, President Eisenhower, that's a great fact. Let's build this system. And so they started building. But, so what did these roads do? Well, it blew open the suburbs. And now everybody's running out to the suburbs. As soon as the road was built, developers are out there. And everybody's doing what Levitt did in, in, in all different ways. So these are some of the big projects in the 60s. You know, Reston up in, up in uh, Virginia and Maryland, Irvine Ranch in California, which was 300,000 acres, Mission Viejo, California, Columbia. These were master plan communities that for the first time had housing, had shopping and everything. But what we did, what we did, because we didn't know how to do this, we had no history, we said, the one thing we can't do is we can't mix housing and retail and industrial and all these things together. Can't do that. We got to put the housing over here. We got to put the retail over here. So what did that do? It, it, it segregated. We had segregated zoning. And we had that for a long time. We had that for like 30, 40 years. And so metal plant communities were created for very narrow reasons. Either it was like 90% of the place where it was all housing rooftops with a few little stores up front, and that became the suburbs. That became the bedroom communities. So what people had to do was get in their cars and had to commute. So all of a sudden, for all the roads we built, we soon, we soon ran out of road capacity. I don't know where this is. Um, so, the American dream moved to suburbia. No one thought about it. I'm, I'm out of the city. I'm getting out of here. And it led to massive urban decay. American cities started literally falling apart at the seams. Because you, the, the, the young people couldn't wait to get out of the city and live in the suburbs. The suburbs got further and further away from the jobs. And, and, but that was what we were doing. Um, and then in the 70s, people started worrying about the environment. We started first about that time, started hearing about, uh, gee, uh, are, we, are we really doing the right thing with the land? Uh, we're taking all these wetlands away and we're covering them up. Is this good? So nothing was done, but people were really starting to talk about it. But meanwhile, in order to distinguish one community from another, in order to say mine has got more toys than yours got, we started building golf courses, gated communities, sidewalks, extensive landscaping. Oh, I got golf courses twice. Various housing types, parks, lakes, green belt, homeowners associations. Little literally planned elitism and snobbery. So they, they got more and more sophisticated, these, these communities. And you see them all around here. I mean, a uh, side story, a number of years ago, uh, the ULL 
DOI asked me to do a lecture on is, what is the difference between a gated community and a non-gated community. And so, because I, I built many, many gated communities in my career. So I thought about this extensively. I went around and I introduced, and I interviewed uh, police chiefs, homeowners associations, people, and so forth. And it became apparent to me that I, in my life, had been part of building something that was creating social barriers. Those walls and those gates and those big hedges and trees, what they really say, I'm going to sound like a real extreme leftist here, but I'm not. I live in there and you can't, or you don't. And so that unfortunately got quoted in the Sun Sentinel. <coughs> and I got phone calls from a couple of people up in Boca Raton that you would have thought that I beat their kids up. <laughs> How dare you say I'm a snob? How dare you say this and that? And everything. So, but I really believe that. <laughs> I really believe she's a snob, okay? Now, ironically, I live in a gated community. Right? So, I'm a, uh, there are just some old things you can't get rid of. But I want to point out to you here is how we moved as a society and how, how, why we got there, because it's going to change. So, with metamorphosing into the 1980s, what's really going on? Well, because these houses have so many bells and whistles, and because the houses are getting bigger and bigger, a Levittown house was 900 square feet. By the 1980s, we passed 2,000 square feet. So we more than doubled. We should have that futurist here, right? We more than double the size of the house into the 80s. And America's not going to accept a 900 square foot house. It's just not on the radar screens. We needed two incomes now. All of a sudden, women's mothers, living partners, or whatever you want, the other part of the household had to go to work. Because we could single salary income couldn't afford the suburbia that we built. So all of a sudden, within a 10 to 15 year period, over 60% of women are now in the workforce. And driven by the need to sustain the American dream. So the American dream at this point is getting to be pretty heavy. Pretty heavy to carry. That needed two automobiles. And of course, people then started saying, you know, I got a few extra bucks. I'm going to buy a condo in Disney World or a timeshare or uh, there's a villa on a golf course up in North Carolina. So all of a sudden, the industry started building a lot of second homes. And this was great for the industry and the home, boat, the home builders. Man, it was not only we building primary homes, we're building secondary homes now. So everybody's working and everybody's doing well, but we're not paying attention to what we're creating around ourselves. So it became obvious to some people, this is not sustainable. Where is this all going? And can we keep stretching the urban boundaries? And how are we going to save our cities? And are we going to have to keep absorbing green fields that keep going on? I mean, you can be in downtown Atlanta. I don't know. If you, anybody familiar with Atlanta? You can be in downtown Atlanta, and there, Atlanta suburbs today go out 50, 60 miles. And they still consider themselves Atlanta. It's, it's insane. Um, when the major debates start forming, I'm getting serious, in the 1980s, of should we have growth or should we have no growth? That's when the people, some of the people started standing up and saying, Lower the gate, I'm here, don't let anybody else in. Particularly true in Florida, California, Arizona. It's like, I've got my piece of paradise. I don't think we should have any more growth here. We have plenty of housing. 
So I'm going to go down to the wait a minute, I'm not in there yet. I want a house to house Okay. So we have all the, then we have transportation problems. We don't have enough roads. Education now starts getting hurt. How does it get hurt? Because governments start diverting, diverting education money to infrastructure and to repairing infrastructure and to building more roads and, 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 to, and to building bridges and to, the, to accommodate the nightmare we, we started <coughs> 10 years before that. So education started getting hurt because, of, mostly because of lack of funding. And because then everybody said, our air isn't clean, our water isn't clean, stop everything. And, but however, there were no guidelines. It was who was the most politically powerful. I was part of a group in 1988, 89, 90. I was president of a company at that time called Markborough Communities. We were one of the largest land development companies in North America at the time. We had to go to Washington. We, along with 15 other companies, major developers and farming companies, by the way, Cargill was one of them. We formed an association. We donated, I think each company put up $100,000 a year each. The presidents of the companies all went to Washington to walk up and down the halls of Congress because the EPA and the Corps of Army Engineers had gotten so powerful, they literally were going to shut down the real estate industry. They, they really were. It would have shut down the industry. And finally, after three years, we were able to take this, up, <coughs> this whole thing down. So this is a pendulum that keeps swinging back and forth. Uh, okay, 1990s, things are really in a state of diversion. I mean, as this group is fighting this group, they looked almost, the industry started looking like what our Congress looks like today. I mean, you either on one side of the table or the other, and it got really ugly. Um, sprawl now has been, is identified as the biggest problem the country has, which in a lot of ways the sprawl was bad. You now know from what I just told you how the sprawl came about. So they came away with some new solutions, things called new urbanism and smart growth, a lot of buzzwords, and different, all new urbanism really is when you get down to it is, is designing streets and towns and everything like we did in 1910. Uh, so it had this old romantic concept of, uh, let's go back to the old days. We started putting porches on the front of houses, and we had this branding BS that says, look, here's the old days. People sat on their porch, said hello to their neighbors, and everybody was kumbaya and everything, which we know living in America, that's nonsense. I mean, how many of you know five of your neighbors on your street? A few, okay. You look like a very kind of person that should go around making friends. I'm talking to the dog, the passenger, bring anything up. Yeah, no, I'm not saying people don't talk to each other, but it's not the kumbaya that the new urbanists talk about, okay. Um, but what we start doing now, we start talking mixed use. We start saying, hey, enough of this nonsense. We got to put housing on top of retail. We, you know, we, we, we got to lower these zoning crazy borders and boundaries that we have. And we got to open up town centers and we've got to create high density. And we need urban renewal. We got to fix our cities. So this, in the 90s, there was a big movement towards this. And this is what we had to get rid of. So segregated zoning had to go away. It just had to go away. We had to get rid of this concept to break out and to start being more realistic with where we build and how we build and why we build. And then there's projects that came along, Meisner Park, Seaside, Celebrations. And these are all projects around the country and here in South Florida. That, have you all, any been to Meisner Park up in Boca? Okay. It's, it's a small compact project, but it's got, it has it all. It has housing. It has office. It has retail. It has entertainment. <coughs> it has social uh, facilities. Uh, so it's all crammed into around 
18 to 20, no, I guess 27 acres of 30 acres. So that's, you know, we've made the breakthrough. But what happens, and we still don't know how we're going to start this, is the gap now between the haves and the have-nots starts growing again. See, in, in 1945, the gap between the haves and the have-nots was humongous, particularly in the segregated world of black America and white America, and then immigrants and so forth. And the 70s and 80s, with everybody trying to get into the American dream, took a lot of that away. We actually mediated a lot of that then. But now that we're going off in different directions again, the gap starts growing again. And the American dream now becomes unaffordable to a lot of people. OK, it's the 2000s. What are we trying to do now? This is uh, my support. Um, we're now we're striving for sustainability. Keyword, you're going to hear this word for the rest of your life. What is sustainability? It just means something that is built right today and it's going to remain right in the future. That's what literally sustainability means. It's not a short-term thing. It, it has enough merits to it that we want to maintain it into the future. You have green developments and, of course, a lot of things that have helped somewhat mediate or mitigate, really, the problems of all this is government started doing partnerships deals with developers, and that was very helpful. So if you're building a new master plan community today, on, in, the night, in the 2000, you, you're working on sustainability, and you're supporting economic, uh, economic stability and growth, and you're participating in the solutions of the environment, transportation, and education. The developers finally get around, and they're God bless them, I love them, I've been a developer all my life. We are the last people to get on board what has to be done. Home builders and developers are horrible. They, they resist and they fight to the very end. But the smart ones today, the ones that have survived, are past that. All right, so a quick, couple of quick observations. The population explosion of the last 50 years drove this. In 1940, starting in 1947, 1948, the baby boomers were born. And the baby boomers went on for 15 years. These GIs and these female military people, and uh, man, they had babies. I mean, you know, it, it was like, it was an incredible, it was the biggest population boom at the time. So that fed all these things that are going on to build the American <coughs> But you might want to know this as a side thing. It's not that you could do much with this. If you take all of the people in the United States and, and isolate all the places that have 2,000 people or more, in other words, it has to be a town or a village that has 2,000 people or more, and you put them all together, we use up less than 5% of the land in the United States. So when they tell you we're running out of land, get in an airplane, get a window seat, and fly from Miami to Los Angeles or to San Francisco, and you will fly for hours without seeing anything. And oh, by the way, you and I own 60% of all the land in the United States west of the Mississippi. 60% of all the land in the United States west of the Mississippi is owned by government. And all government keeps telling us, you can't go on your own property, and you can't develop your own property, because this belongs to somebody in the future or something. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be preserving land, but just to give you some balance about what the real numbers are. From, 19, from 2010 and on, our population is going to increase 45 million people, 45 million people by the year 2025. 
120 million people by two. I'm like this futuristic guy now, okay? Okay. If we have 45 million people going from 2010, a 15-year period, that is 3 million a year. Now, last year we put 2.9 million new people in America. We've been doing 3 million a year for the last 20 years. And the demographers say we're going to continue that for another 30 years. And then our population is going to take a nosedive, like it's happening in Japan and China and so on. But if you say that each household has 2.1 people, or 1.9 people, depending on, we're going to need 20 to 30 million new households, homes, in this country. Actually, in the next 30 years, we have to double the stock of housing in America. No matter whether it's in the cities, whether it's in the suburbs, some of it's going to be out in the suburbs, a lot of it in new and green fields. But how we're going to build them differently is the following. We're going to build big master plan communities, say, in the middle of, the, let's say Florida, 30 miles northeast of Orlando right now. There's a new project got approved. And it's called the, the Desert Ranch. It's owned by the Mormon Church. The Mormon Church owns 200,000 acres of land in Central Florida. They carved off 40,000 acres, and they're planning a city that's going to take 60 years to build. And when it's finished, it's going to have a population of over half a million people. But it's not just going to be houses. It's going to be office buildings. It's going to be retail. It's going to be eye trade. It's going to be, it's going to be an urban collection of itself. And that way, if you want what you're telling, what market research is saying to us that people your age want to be closer to their jobs, want to be able to walk to more things, uh, you're willing to sacrifice the, the size of your housing for convenience and location of your housing. So we call that the urban effect. The new plan communities of the future are going to have all of that different than the Levittowns were. We're going to do it right this time. So we're going to, we're going to be able to build all this. Now, and then we're going to, by the way, we're going to take a little break after this, and then I want, what I want to pick up on, why aren't housing, why is housing struggling so much in America, and why can't it get up off its feet? Since, in, since the year 2008. It's never happened in the history of housing in America. And I'm telling you right now as a little side thing, the housing industry, your industry, is suffering today. Um, well, let me quickly finish this. Oh, no, I want to go back to that. Here's another thing. This is going to take 50 million new vehicles on the roads in America. So, that's why we need autonomous cars. Um, and 100 million by the year 2050. Okay. Over 75% of new development over the next 50 years will occur in the green fields, as I just said. Technological advances will alter American way of living. I hope that little preamble that we watched gave you some flavor of how fast it's coming at you. Uh, when you start thinking about that pond, and you say, you put a pond every day, and you say, you mean by the 20th day, I only, I, I, I've only covered less than 1%? Yeah, because the, the, the next to last day has to be 50%. And so you can see how numbers geometrically go crazy. That's what we're up against. Um, what we also need are more bill levits. Over the, year, over the last 50 years, we've had people in our industry that have come along and taken this thing to the next platform. And where the, our industry has been void of such people for about 20 years now. Uh, you know, is that person or is that guy or that gal out there? Of course. It always happens. I mean, just, you know, the, the, all of a sudden a Steve Jobs comes along. All of a sudden a Bill Gates comes along. 
all of that. That person for our industries is, is, is going to emerge eventually and take this whole thinking platform to another level that I have no idea what could it be. I'm only sad, personally, that I'm not going to be around to participate in it because I love all this stuff. Um, so, the new, new method plan communities paradigms have to have the best parts of the past and, and the best of today's elements and has to have room for growth and change and discovery. It cannot be planned through a rear view mirror. You're not going to find answers looking in a rear view mirror. You're going to have to have the courage and the vision of stepping out into something that's risky and scary but exciting. And the thing that separates most successful developers, who by the way go broke about three times in their lives, uh, is fire in the belly. You must have a passion for development. You must, we just, and I'm going to talk about, when we come back from break, uh, all the different places in the real estate industry you can have a passion for if that's the way you're characteristically built and who you are. There are only one Bill Gates out of, uh, I mean, Bill uh, Gates out of a million. There's only one Bill Levitt out of a million. That tipping point person is not in this room. Okay, that's okay. Because, uh, because it's okay. We just need him or her to come along so we can get on with our lives because we want to get on his train. Or her train. Then I think too. <laughs> no. No. 65% of the growth of executive leadership in the real estate industry, 65% of the last 10 years has been women. So it's taken a long time for the breakthrough, but it's getting there. When I was developing, it was a macho, stupid thing that came out of home building. Guy with the hammer and the guy with the, you know, with the boots and the helmet and everything. And can't have women out here. This is a man's job. Well, with the tools that are around today, with computers and, I mean, hydraulic guns and hammers and I, you know, it's ridiculous. But more importantly, in the leadership platform of, of a development company, the back rooms, the the executive rooms and everything. It was so ridiculous that we kept women out of that. And I will do this. I had, when I had, when I was President of Mark Burrow, I had about 1,000 employees. I had about 250 people in my executive positions. 180 of them were women. So, and I paid them just as much as everybody else. But I was an exception. And, and I got criticized. And in fact, my, I, I reported to uh, a chairman of the board of my company who was up in Toronto. And he never he hardly ever criticized me. One time at lunch, he says, you know, aren't you making too much of an effort with women? <laughs> and I just let it go. I said, no, I think it's all working out fine. But uh, he didn't do anything about it. He just, it was just the way that mentality. I'm telling you, a lot of that's gone today. It really is gone. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the past. It is what it is. You can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. It's where we go from today. Why don't we take a 10-minute break? Ten minutes. <laughs>
What, the, the one thing that doesn't exist, there is no straight ladder. <laughs> and if you're looking for one, you're never going to find it. The road, and I look at myself, and the road I took. Uh, yeah. I mean, it has no reality to it. And I have all my friends, all of you, like, right. right. It's like one of these. Sometimes one of these, and then back again. <laughs> Right and yesterday, I went down. They gave me all the infrastructure and the price for the garden, all the requirements and stuff. Sure. I want to know that one. Well, can you imagine if it was 1945 and, and you're you were a scientist? We're a nation of hundreds. Uh, and somebody says 50 years from now. We have three conditions. Where are they going to be? Where are they going to be? No one had a vision of the industry. No one had a vision of, of you know, computer. I'm older. I mean, when I was younger, I mean, you know what my what my spreadsheet was? It was big green accounting pages that you put all the numbers in. When I went to undergraduate school, I majored in accounting. We did. We did things on worksheets for kids. Erase. So if the number changes over here, the number changes over here, yeah, you have to erase all these numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So if someone told me, hey, one of you has to listen to this, she was going to have a computer, you got the numbers in there, you're going to write a couple of formulas and go there, and you're going to have your own financial solution. Yeah, back to the I like the guy in the bed. Oh, yeah. So that means. Yeah. Wow. Wind up. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a long story, but I tried to buy that something and they turned me down. I said, I'm not going to be, I don't want to run something. I think I'm going to be a man. I think I'm going to be a man. Demographic specialists. 
you deal with market research people. All those people interplay in land planning. So if you're in sitting in the land developer seat, you are going to reach out to any one of or all of those people like this. They're going to be a part of your life and your project. And so eventually you have to understand what they do and what they don't do and what you want them to do and what you don't want them to do. Like for instance, the last thing you ever want to do is to take a raw piece